The world of digital logic is a pretty cool place. Everything you touch nowadays has millions or billions of transistors inside it. From your humble watch to your pocket-sized computer, it's transistors all the way down. But what does that look like and how do they interact? Let's take a deep dive into the world of digital logic design and basically build our own ASIC. Let's start out at the highest level, then dig deeper to smaller components. Here I've got a seven segment display. I'd like a convenient way to drive it. I could connect each of the seven segments to a drive pin, but that requires a lot of I.O. Instead, what if I can insert a device between the display and my microcontroller, which allows me to drive it with only four pins. With four binary inputs, we can represent 0 to 15. This is called binary coded decimal. The input device takes that binary number input and drives the display in a way that displays the decimal number we're feeding it. This is the basic BCD decoder. We're going to implement this IC using only transistors, but again, baby steps. We know what we want, so let's define the logic to get there. Let's discuss logic gates, starting with the most simple, the inverter. Digital logic has two states, high and low. Low is zero volts, and high is some voltage above that, typically positive 3.3 or 5 volts. The inverter takes in an input and returns the, well, inverse. Shocking, I know. So, if you feed this device a logic low, 0 volts, it spits out a logic high, 5 volts. Similarly, if I feed it a high voltage, it spits out a low voltage. This table is called a truth table and shows the set of outputs for a given set of inputs associated with this gate. Let's now discuss the OR gate. This is slightly more complex than the inverter. It has two inputs and one output. If any or both of those inputs are high, then the output will be high. In other words, this gate only has a low output if none of the inputs are high. Finally, we have the AND gate. The AND gate also has two inputs, but it only outputs a high when both inputs are high. Its truth table looks like this. We can build upon this once more to gates with more than two inputs. Draw out the truth table for a three input OR gate and a three input AND gate now. Their truth tables look like this. For the AND gate, the output is only high if all the inputs are high. And for the OR gate, the output is only low if all of the inputs are low. Great, let's go back to that BCD converter and apply some similar logic. You may have realized that there is also a truth table for the BCD converter. It looks like this. On the left side, we have the binary count common to all segments. And on the right side, we have an output column for each segment, A through G. Let's focus exclusively on segment A for now. Looking at this output, it's pretty obvious that we can't just use a four input AND or OR gate here. We need something more complex and combinational. Perhaps some complex combinational logic. We're going to combine a few AND OR inverter gates, AOI, together to make a combination to handle the output for segment A. There are numerous ways to do this, but I'm going to jump straight into KMAPs. The KMAP is another graphical representation of the truth table, which allows us to calculate the logic required for a given input. It all starts with this drawing here. We copy the output of the truth table into this drawing and group like values into boxes sized to powers of 2. This allows us to simplify the inputs, reducing the gate count. We then add or OR the boxes together to achieve the overall expression. For segment A, this is B, not C, not D, ORed with not A, not B, not C, D. You'll then repeat these steps for all seven segments and come up with this list of expressions. The groups of letters are all ANDed together, and the pluses represent OR gates. We can implement these in a schematic like so. Note that a bar above a letter means it's inverted. Note the placement of the inverters. Since we used inverted B a few times, we can pull the inverter out and just label it as not B. Congratulations, we're through that level and finally down to the transistor. Your typical MOSFET has three terminals, a gate, a drain, and a source. Drain and source flip depending on the type of MOSFET, but gate remains the same. Think of a MOSFET as a voltage-controlled switch. Let's focus on N-channel MOSFETs, NMOS, first. For an N-channel MOSFET, the source connects to ground and the drain connects to the load. These guys need to be near the ground. The gate then controls the current flow through the device. If the gate is pulled high, current is allowed to flow. If the gate is pulled low, current is unable to flow. A P-channel MOSFET, PMOS, is similar, but a little flipped. A PMOS needs to be near the voltage. The source connects to the voltage source, and the drain connects to the positive terminal of the load. 
if the gate is pulled up to the voltage rail, current is unable to flow. Current is able to flow once the gate is pulled down to ground. So let's go back to the inverter. An inverter requires two MOSFETs to make, an NMOS and a PMOS in this form. Both inputs are tied together, and the output is tapped at the middle. Now for the AND gate. Let's start with this structure. When both A and B are pulled low, current flows from the voltage source, out through the output, making the output high. This already doesn't seem quite right, so let's build a truth table. If either A or B are pulled high, we get the same behavior, so that's a 1 at the output. Finally, if both A and B are pulled high, we inhibit current flowing from the voltage source and allow current to flow to ground. This is a low output. That gives us a truth table, which is conveniently for a NAND gate, an inverted AND gate. So let's take a look at that inverter we just made and stick it on the end of this NAND gate. We now have a proper AND gate. And if you guessed we'd see the same thing for the OR gate, you'd be correct. Here's the full figure. To expand these to three or four input versions, simply add an extra N and P channel MOSFET. For a little more context, this top section is called the pull-up network. The lower section is called the pull-down network. This is because these networks of transistors either pull up or down the output voltage. With all that done, I created a schematic in KiCad, laid out the necessary MOSFETs to create these gates, then laid out this big thing. KiCad really isn't the correct software for this task. I created an individual PCB for each gate, then appended those files as needed to this central file to create the actual decoder. It's a bit of a mess, but it works. I'll ship this design off to PCBWay to have it fabbed, then come back and test it out when it's done. Our friends at PCBWay graciously sponsored this video, so let's talk about them. PCBWay is a board house that makes high quality PCBs for your projects or products. They offer tight tolerances, fast turnaround times, and they have fantastic customer support. Since we had these boards assembled by them, their staff reached out to ensure every step of the process was correct, from component ordering to component placement. If you need PCBs for your next project, check out PCBWay. And it doesn't work. Oops. In my initial excitement for this project, I forgot how K-Maps worked, and I pulled in my truth tables incorrectly. You may have noticed the discrepancy between the schematic and the shown expressions earlier. That's why. I've confirmed the shown expressions to be correct. One easy way to test these boards is to hook them up to an Arduino. The Arduino provides the BCD count, and can also read all seven outputs of the decoder. This allows me to easily put it in a serial monitor, copy it over to Excel, and do some analysis. Here we can see the good output, and here's my present output. The green columns are identical, and I've highlighted the bad segments yellow with bit discrepancies in red text. You can see this another way when I place the good segment A output next to the schematic. Notice the issue? Stay tuned for a future video where we'll put this board under the knife and attempt to make microscopic repairs to restore full function. Can't do that with silicon. Bye!